So I feel like growing up in church and being in church and being around church, I feel like we hear a lot about standing up against peer pressure and doing the right thing even when people around you are doing the wrong thing and taking a stand for what is right. And uh, there's lots of those kinds of teachings in churches and youth groups and veggie tales and all kinds of different lessons that we hear all the time. But I look around at other Christians in the world, at people in the world, taking a stand for what is right and trying to do the right thing, and I see a lot of people who are trying to do the right thing, but sometimes for the wrong reasons. And I want to talk this morning about doing the right thing, about doing the right thing in spite of people around you not doing the right thing, Uh, and then is there a difference between doing it in a good way or a bad way? What is that difference? How do we figure it out? Is it important to do it in the right way, or is it enough to just try to do the right thing? So this week we pick up basically where we left off uh, with the story of Joshua. Moses has destroyed uh, the golden calf. He goes back up on the mountain. He gets some new tablets for the Ten Commandments. He comes down. And then the Israelites take about two years to go through the desert to get to uh, the land that God has promised them. There's a lot, a lot of people, and so it takes them a very long time time to travel not that long a distance. So it's about two years that they are in the desert the first time. Stay tuned. Um, And so they get there and they're like, okay, there are actually already people living here. Turns out this land is really, really good. So it's good enough that there are people living here already. Let's go and see what this situation is. So the story of Joshua obviously begins in the book of Numbers. (laughs) Right? <laughs> we'll get to Joshua 1 later. Um, so they send in these 12 spies, one from every uh, tribe of Israel. And they say, guys, go and look and see what's going on. Is the land any good? Just survey the land, walk around. They didn't have Google Maps. They couldn't just see what was going on. Uh, they had to go and actually see, are there people living there? What are their cities like? How many of them are there? Can we win in battles against them? Go and see what's up. So we got a lot of verses to go through. This is basically one continual story. We're going to split up into a few different chunks. So jump to Numbers. I promise it's the fun part of Numbers, not the beginning, where they're just like, God told Moses to count everybody, and so he did. And then it's just chapter after chapter of lists of names and numbers. Uh, We will jump to the fun part of Numbers. So Numbers 13, um, 27 through 29, this is when they have returned back, and they are giving their report to Moses and the people of Israel. So 27 through 29, and we'd like to read it for us. Emily. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here it's here is here is its fruit. Oh, here, sorry, here is its fruit. <laughs> but the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan crushed all the name pronunciations. I forgot to warn whoever was first, a lot of name pronunciations. Anytime you come across weird names in the Old Testament, that's fine. Just strike out with confidence, get the first and last syllable right, and kind of fudge it in the middle. Nobody will call you out on it if you read with confidence. Pro tip, you can take that away as well from this sermon. Uh, So he comes back and says, there's big fruit. It's flowing with milk and honey. It sounds wonderful, also a little sticky, but it's a great land. Uh, Maybe they're being metaphorical, though. Um, So it's a great land here. However, uh, they followed up by telling Moses that there are a bunch of people living there already. And some of these people are people that the Israelites have uh, already been in conflict with. That in the two years traveling from Egypt to Israel, uh, to Canaan, to the Promised Land, they had already been attacked by and fought off some of these groups of people that they have named here. And so he's just listing these are what's going on. And so Next, Caleb, uh, sort of bolstering uh, the report and trying to encourage people, has his response to uh, that report in, uh, in Numbers 13, 30, 32, just the very next few verses. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. All right, so there's, so there's sort of starting to see two camps here. 
that Caleb is taking a stand and saying, hey, this is a good land, we should go do it, we, 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 can, we can win. And a bunch of other spies are saying, no, we can't, they're spreading a bad report among the people as a result. And so it continues, uh, the response to, to this report sort of circulates the, the, the tents and the tribes and the people of Israel, and um, their response is in the very next verses, just continues straight down. Um, or swiping to the right. If you're on your app, that's fine too. Um, we're very version and form inclusive. Um, but if somebody wants to read Numbers 14 and then like the person next to you, we're just going to read all the way one through nine, but it's a lot of verses. So we can just split it up between two people if you want to do that. Uh, but who has... Well, awesome, great. Thank you. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. As the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in, the, in, or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. <laughs> then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joseph son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, The land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land, and if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. There is... Excellent scene in Josh and the Big Wall, the VeggieTales version of this story, where where they realize what's going on, and they're scared situation, and they're like, "Well, we got to go back to Israel." You know, the sun, the beaches, the Nile, three square meals a day, and they're like, "We were in slavery." <laughs> this is really, really, really obvious. People here are terrified. They're scared. They would rather go back across the desert where they were attacked through the wilderness to be enslaved in Egypt than go forward into the promised land. So this is our first big lesson. Everything sort of builds on its, itself in, uh, in this message. Um, but the Israelites were being motivated by fear. <laughs> they were afraid. We shouldn't be people who are motivated by fear. One of our core verses at a blaze is 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and read that for us. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flames the gift that God has given you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Fear shouldn't be what motivates us as Christians. Fear is not what motivates us. So Joshua and Caleb are the two spies out of the 12 who stand up and say, no, we can win. We don't have to be afraid. We have God on our side. Is it because they, they wanted to go to the promised land? They said, we can do this. Is it because they had scouted everything out and said, well, because of these great strategies we have, we know their weaknesses, we have these great plans. Is it because, you know, it's worth the risk? No, that wasn't their approach. They wanted to go to the promised land because they were trusting God with what he could do. They knew God could carry them through no matter what. If God is on their side, they can do anything. There's a few different layers that we want to hit here. First off, we want to be like uh, Caleb and Joshua. We want to be people who can say, you know what, this is the right thing. And in spite of everyone around me trying to do the wrong thing, I'm going to stand up and try to do the right thing. We want to be able to do that. But also, we need to make sure that as we're doing so, we're not motivated by fear as we're trying to do the right thing. It's really easy to slip into being motivated by fear. Are we trying to do the right thing because we're worried about everyone around us being led into a path of destruction and we want to make sure we don't do the wrong thing? Are we motivated by not wanting to sin? This goes into um, some of what we were talking about on Friday night. Um, but there's this really important distinction in being motivated by fear versus by trusting God. And I think that why is really significant. So there's a difference between saying to someone, hey, don't sin because it'll make your life worse, versus I want you to draw closer to God. And I want you to continue trusting in God. And oh, by the way, as you do that, you will also stop sinning and that's good for you. 
But there's a real difference between those two things. There's a real difference between those two things. So uh, just briefly, if you weren't there on Friday, uh, we talked about this. It's this idea of we want to be people who walk towards something rather than away from something. If you're trying to get to Owens and you're standing on the drill field, you have to get there by going to Owens. You can't get there by going away from Burris. If you just walk away from Burris and that is how you travel, who knows where you'll end up. So we want to be people who aren't saying, I just don't want to do the wrong thing. I would rather pursue a deeper relationship with God, know him more, understand him more. Oh, there's a lot of good stuff here. A lot of times we end up being afraid of missing out on opportunities, on disappointing God, on um, making sure that God isn't, isn't going to punish us, so we don't want to do the wrong thing because God's going to punish us. We, that's sometimes our motivation, and that's being motivated by fear. We're afraid of these bad outcomes. We're afraid of what might happen if, as opposed to saying, I'm going to trust God with whatever happens. I want to do what God wants me to do. Not, I'm afraid to do something God doesn't want me to do, but instead saying, I'm walking towards this thing. You see that distinction? It ends up, you end up walking in the same direction, but the heart behind it, the motivation, is so totally different. If you're saying, I just don't want to do the wrong thing, afraid, I'm afraid, I'm fear, versus I want to walk towards God, I want to trust him to do the right thing. Okay, so we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing in spite of what those around us do, are doing. We want to be motivated by uh, hope and by love. So how do we know what are the right things and what are the wrong things? How do we know how to stand up for the things with the right motivation? There's a Sunday school answer here. Jesus, <laughs> right? We try to model off of what did Jesus do? How did he love? What was his motivation? What was his heart? But I think it is also uh, worth noting Jesus is the example, but I think context is key here. I'm going to bring up something that I think is not talked about a lot in church that I think will maybe change the way you look at and think about certain things. Um, it is worth noting how Jesus spoke to who he was speaking to. Just back that up for a second. Jesus did not speak the exact same way to every single person he interacted with. A lot of times we think, oh, all the red letters are exactly the same and they apply to every single person exactly the same. I don't think that's true. I think that there's a difference between how Jesus spoke to Jewish leaders of the faith who were leading people astray and straining at a gnat and being legalistic, and I think there's a difference between how he was speaking to his disciples, his apostles, his followers, how he was speaking to Jewish people who were encouraging and challenging them, how he was speaking to a lost person, a centurion, a Roman. He was speaking to all these different people in different ways. And I want to highlight that um, by, by just looking at these two different passages. This is both Jesus speaking to people who are sinning. In Matthew 23, 25 through 28, he's speaking to the Pharisees and says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of bones and the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Okay, now we compare that with how he spoke to the woman caught in adultery in John 8. 3 through 11. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery to Jesus. They made her stand before the group and they said to Jesus, Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning, he straightened up and said to, him, said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and said, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now 
and leave your life of sin. In both of these instances, Jesus is opposing sin. He's standing against sin. But he does so very differently. He does so very differently because he's speaking to two different people. And a lot of times we feel like if we want to really highlight and emphasize Jesus' justice and attack on hypocrisy and false religiosity and legalism, we use those certain phrases and passages and words of Jesus. And if we want to highlight and emphasize Jesus' love and his mercy, then we highlight and emphasize certain other passages but I think he spoke differently to different people, and that's important. I think that's significant. That as we're interacting with people and how we are taking a stand against things and who we are taking a stand with and for and against, how we're speaking matters. What kind of motivation we have matters. There's a real big difference between you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness and then neither do I condemn you. I think that context is really important. I think this should be our model as well. And fear should not be what motivates us. You know, there's the difference between is there a public religious leader who is leading people astray? Maybe we should deal with them pretty firmly, pretty harshly. Is there a fellow believer who's struggling and caught in sin? We should be willing to walk alongside them, challenge them firmly but gently. Is there a lost person who's struggling in their sin? Why are we even bringing up sin? They have a way bigger problem than their sin. They don't know Jesus. Pointing out sin to them doesn't do anything. They can't deal with it. They can't even handle it. Luckily, we don't have to clean our lives up before we can come to God. Because we couldn't. We can't stop sinning on our own. We need his help. So trying to interact with a lost person and say, hey, you have to fix this in your life. And only then God's going to love you. Or even just focusing on, hey, you've got to fix this in your life. Why are we focusing on that? They need Jesus. But also, if we're sharing with somebody who is leading people astray, or their hearts are hardened, or they're a fellow believer who's living a life of sin and not at all willing to acknowledge or change, we should be willing to deal with those people pretty firmly, pretty harshly. We're, we're called to hold them to a certain standard. We should do so out of love and trusting God and not being motivated by fear. That's an important, significant difference. But I think that's a really important distinction that we have when thinking about how are we interacting with people? What's our motivation? What's our heart? So next we have sort of what happens next in the story of Joshua. So God is obviously very angry with the people of Israel. They have once again rebelled against God. Um, and the outcomes were not great. Um, so what ended up happening is every adult who rebelled, um, God said, okay, fine. You guys are going to wander in the desert for 40 years until every adult who rebelled has died. And then you guys can go in. Anybody who didn't rebel, including uh, Aaron and Moses and Joshua and Caleb, you guys can go in. That's fine. Of course, turns out later on, Moses ends up rebelling against God because he doesn't trust God. He ends up acting out of anger and fear. Uh, once again, another lesson there. And then uh, Joshua ends up taking over as the leader of Israel and beginning to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. And as he is about to go in, uh, this is what God shares with Joshua in 1 through 9. This is another beefy passage. If people want to split that up, uh, that's fine. But if you want to just take it all yourself, go for it. Uh, but can somebody read Joshua verses 1 through 9 for us? Thank you. Let's see. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, um, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. 
Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from the left, uh, do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. How many times does he say be strong and courageous? It's three times in just four verses. God often uses uh, repetition for emphasis in Scripture. And if it's that condensed of a repetition, I think it's probably really important. Joshua is about to do a really hard thing. And he needs to be strong and courageous as he trusts God to take care of him. A lot of times, we end up having to do the same thing. And that's what I want for all of us. It's hard to stand up and do the right thing. It's hard to, in spite of other people around you doing the wrong thing, for you to stand up and say, I'm going to do the right thing. And it's even harder to do so with the right motivation. Because it's really easy to say, well, this is what everybody else is doing. I'm just going to go along with that. And it's almost just as easy to say, well, I'm going to do this other thing, and I'm going to stand up for what's right, but I'm going to do so motivated by fear of doing the wrong thing, God's disappointment or his judgment or missing out on something or whatever. It's really, really hard. I'm going to do it motivated by love, by grace, and by trusting God all the way through. But that's what I want for all of us. Sometimes it's hard, too, to know what is my motivation? It's easy to trick ourselves into thinking, well, I'm doing the right thing, so it must be for the right reasons. But it's also easy to end up doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. So I want to just challenge you guys this week to be thinking about that, to look for opportunities where you can be strong and courageous and trust God with the outcomes, but also to question yourself. Are you trying to do the right thing for the wrong reasons? Where is your heart? What are the right reasons? And if you are being motivated by the wrong reasons, how do you change? Some of these things are stuff we're going to talk about on Friday night. We're going to figure out what are the right things, what are the wrong things, what's the right and wrong motivation. We're going to get into some specifics. And then even more importantly, I think we're going to talk about, okay, I'm trying to do the right thing, but I realize it's for the wrong reasons. How do I change my thinking? How do I change my beliefs to line up with God, what does it look like? What does it mean to trust God in these outcomes and not be motivated by fear? These are bad things I'm trying to avoid. I should do that. That's a good thing, right? Not if that's your motivation, because again, that's motivated by fear. And we're not given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Let's pray.